Hello and welcome to another episode of Under the Bonnet, where I, David Stevenson, try and get under the bonnet of an interesting thematic exchange-traded fund, or ETF. Um, I've got Howie Lee with me from Elgium ETFs, and we've also got Richard Lightbound from an index firm called Robo Global. And that probably gives you an idea of what we're going to talk a bit about, robotics, and to a lesser degree, AI, and also healthcare. Over the last couple of years, we've had a massive boom in the amount of interest in tech ETFs generally, in thematic ETFs and tech thematic ETFs in particular. But we've also seen the emergence of some quite interesting novel ETFs, particularly around this robotics space. Now, I think I'm a bit of a sci-fi geek. I think the robotics and AI space is really very interesting. And it's probably very different than your mainstream tech funds. These tend to have a lot of the big fang names in or very software orientated or increasingly e-commerce orientated. Whereas actually, if you look under the bonnet of many of the robotics ETFs particularly, they're much more kind of hardware focused, a lot of more engineering companies in there. But also we've got the emergence of AI, artificial intelligence, which again drags it back to the software area. It's also a global area, a global market. A lot of Japanese companies are very powerful in this area. The Chinese companies are also coming up fast. So it's a great sector to understand what's going on in this thematic ETF. And I thought I'd start off by asking Howie Lee a few more details about the ETF itself. Howie, welcome. Um, tell me just a little bit about the robotics and AI ETFs you've got. And, and I suppose it's obvious what sectors they track, but can you give us a little bit more detail about what's going on inside these ETFs? Uh, the big one is the robotics one. You've also got a more recent one, I think the AI one, is that right? Just tell us a bit about them, Harry. Yeah, that's right. So the first uh, ETF we'll, I'll talk about is indeed our robotics ETF that we have built together with Robo Global, a relationship that, ex- that is all, all the way back to almost eight years now. Uh, and in that portfolio, um, it's very much a collection of different new economies and industries that really reflect where robotics and automation is really being deployed. So that's across areas like manufacturing, warehousing, uh, down to the, the retail side. So what if this is, it is very much a broad portfolio and not just a technology fund. Okay, and then you've separately got an AI one as well, is that right? Yeah, that's right. So that, that's where we take artificial intelligence, which has always been a component within the robotics fund itself. But we take a deeper dive into the area of artificial intelligence, again, with the Robo Global team. And so, you know, within the artificial intelligence, you'll see a lot more focus, perhaps perhaps a little bit more of the tech names, perhaps a little bit more of the large cap names. And, you know, the overlap between those two portfolios is actually extremely low. Uh, the, the key point here is if an investor is looking for a more broad based approach towards capturing the robotics and automation opportunity, our robotics fund is very much that. And it, whereas on the artificial intelligence side, that's where if investors want to look at more tech orientated type stocks, um, but also very much focus on artificial intelligence specifically, that's where the exposure um, should, should be had. Okay. Um- and why is the why are these ETFs different from traditional tech ETFs? Um, there's lots of big kind of Fang ETFs, tech sector ETFs. Does it does there a lot of crossover between the two between the kind of traditional tech sector and these robotics and AI ETFs, or are they a bit are they very different? Yeah, no, they're very different. Um, if you take a look at just overlap across, let's just take a look at the uh, robotics portfolio itself. Um, you know, a typical overlap with, let's say, S and P five hundred, less than three, um, about three percent, uh, with a typical technology index, roughly about five percent. So the whole idea across, in fact, all the themes that we create, um, including these um, products that we do with Robo Global, they're very much designed to complement existing equity building blocks that many investors have. So if we think about asset allocation, many investors uh, utilize regional building blocks. Um, And our global thematic portfolios here, including the robotics and automation, artificial intelligence here, as well as the healthcare breakthrough, those can actually sit alongside each other in a complementary fashion with low overlap. Um, And each of these portfolios are focused, but still very diversified in order to give exposure to the long-term growth of each of these three themes. 
Okay, I want to bring in Richard Lightband at this point from, from Robo Global. Um, and, and, and Richard, welcome. Um, I, I, what's the origins, the origins of the index? How did you, how did you, how did you get the, uh, the index into existence? Where did it come from? I'm just curious to know its origins and back history. Yeah, David, hi. So, yeah, our, our journey, if you will, at Robo Global really started. It was crack. It was almost eight years ago in, in 2013 when really as investors ourselves, we saw this very interesting um, growth opportunity ahead for robotics and automation. As we looked into the market, we realized there was literally no coverage. So there was no index, there was no industry classification, there was no way to really access the theme. So we put together our own um, research team. We assembled a group of industry experts. We actually put the first robotics and automation investment strategy into the market. So it's been live for seven years. Right now, it's about 80, 84 companies. We think what's you know really critical when you're thinking about these sort of future focused in investment themes is you've got to combine active research with industry experts we think then the sort of, if you will, the, the, the quantitative benefits and the discipline of, of indexing and in, um, index investing is, um, is, is, is really important. So we very much spend our time researching this robotics and automation theme. We work very closely with the management teams of, of the index members and, and sort of um, the broader database of companies. We're scoring companies across various criteria. And we then work with with product partners like like Elgin, who license our indices and actually launch ETFs and funds globally. Okay, so how? But I'm interested to know how did you get interested in robotics? What's that backstory um, as investors? Because when you did it first, which is 2013, I mean that. It, I mean a lot of robotics is still slightly sci-fi-ish. Um, I'm a big sci-fi fan. We always think the robotics age has come, but in 2013 it hadn't really come. So how how did you? What got you interested in robotics in the first place? Well, it was, I mean, I mean, for me personally, I've, I've you know, always been involved in disruptive um, innovation. I did a very early cloud computing startup in, in 1999. And it was actually an article by um, a research group that's called GavCal that, that I read. And it basically the headline said, dear investors, please pay, pay attention to robots and in the article, they explained how, in their view, robots were literally going mobile. They were leaving the factory shop floor. They were becoming technologically advanced. And you were starting to see this technology appear in hospitals, on farms. It was entering our homes. It was turning into new product areas like 3D, 3D printers. And yeah, I read it and thought, crikey, that's, that, that's, that's great. You know, I, I want some exposure to this theme. I went back to GavCal. Gavcal said, we've actually got quite a few interesting investors who are asking the same question, including some pretty heavy hitters from the, the, the world of robotics and automation as entrepreneurs and, and academics. So that, that's how the core team at RoboGlobal actually mm -hmm. came together. We were sort of personally interested in, in the theme. And as we started to, to build the strategy, we realized that we could we could commercialize it. So we're we're very much a we're a private company. We 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 focus on research. We we don't manage money. Again, our, our partners like Elgin do that. And since launching Robo, as, as Harry was just describing earlier, we've then broadened two areas of coverage that we have in the, the Robo strategy. One one is healthcare. So we have a separate healthcare tech and innovation index. And the, the other area is artificial intelligence. So again, there's a, a separate artificial intelligence index as well. And how do you mentioned a bit earlier? How do you how do you decide which stocks go in? You have a point scoring system. Talk me through that. How does that work? Because I imagine it might be quite difficult with some companies that are borderline. You know, they they might have significant robotics interests. So that, that's a good example, actually. My Amazon, for instance, you know, it is quite a big player in robotics. Certainly a big buyer of robotics. Um, and certainly be developing robotics, but you wouldn't think of it as a robotics company. So how do you decide what's a robotics company and what isn't a robotics company? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a really important question. And I think this is something that investors need to, to pay a lot of attention to is, you know, as, as you look at different robotics and automation strategies, as you're saying, David, you know, what, what's their definition? Um, and for us, just to continue your example there, I mean, we, we do review, we do score Amazon. But yes, as you said, we very much see Amazon as a as a sort of a user of this technology. They're not actually a maker of this technology. So within our strategy, what we're really focused on is identifying companies that are 
making robots for different end um, market applications. So it could be factories, it could be hospitals, it could be farms. What we're also investing into is the supply chain. So we, we've identified core areas of technology that enable robots, so things like sensing, machine, um, machine learning, navigation, algorithms. And really what we did eight years ago is we sat down with our industry experts and we said, look, there is no industry classification system here. Let's build our own roadmap. And th the outcome there was what we call our, our subsectors. Right now we have 11 subsectors that we focus on. And as a, a research process, we will look at our internal database of about a thousand public and private companies. We'll identify which companies fit into these 11 subsectors for our robotics and automation investment theme. And then, as you said, David, we're, we're going to score them. And the, the score is derived across several factors. So we'll look at revenue purity for each company. We'll then um, assess each company and give them a market leadership rank, a technology rank, and then also an investment rank. And we combine those four factors together to give an overall one to hundred score. And basically the highest scoring companies within different areas of each subsector potentially move forward to become a member of a strategy, assuming they pass our ESG policy. And we then take that, that very concentrated universe of names and we literally pass it then into what we would call a more traditional index filtering process where we actually then um, will assess the companies across a, a minimum market cap, a minimum li li liquidity. There's a couple of other filters that get applied there. But if, a comp if companies pass that, they're then a member of the index. Their score will determine their weight. And you essentially end up with one to two percent positions for four companies in, in the strategy. And this is, this is all done on a quarterly process. So, you know, we're pretty responsive. If every quarter we're going to reset the company weights based on their score, we'll also make any changes to, to the strategy based on companies that, you know, sort of fail or, or pass that, that scoring research process. OK, and I want to just quick follow on question. How do you dif di put a distinction between robotics and, say, some of the more AI led stuff. You obviously have two separate indices, but as Harry said, that you have some AI stuff inside your robotics index. How do you do the? How do you differentiate between? Because there's probably a big, big crossover in AI and and even machine learning and robotics. How do you draw the line there? Yeah, you know, it's 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 a really interesting question. Um, so I think you know, it, I'll, I'll re let me reply from sort of perhaps you know a little bit of a a, a tech sort of perspective, and then sort of as more as a, as an investor, but. You know, from, from a, a tech in, um, perspective, you know, you can't have artificial intelligence without very big yeah. data sets. And, yeah. you know, big data and analytics are not new. We've, we've had a lot of that for, for a long time. But what is new are these very powerful AI algorithms now that can derive value and can spot and basically make predictions based on high quality data sets. And that has really been uh, enabled also by um, much cheaper and very powerful computing okay yeah. and robots are very well positioned in, in this whole process in terms of collecting the data robots are equipped with a ever increasing number of sensors so they're very good at gathering that data and that data has a massive value because if if they can learn and um make predictive decisions from it, they become more productive, they become more useful. We can deploy these robots in, in, in more and more areas. So you're absolutely right that there is absolutely an, an overlap here. If you look at our two strategies, if you look at the robotics and automation and the AI strategy, you've got just over a 10% member overlap, but by weight. But I think what's really important is if, if you continue to look in more detail at those two strategies, what you'll see in robotics and, and automation is a it's an international portfolio of about 84 companies right now. It's got a tilt to small and mid cap companies. These are all established, proven businesses. You've got a lovely mix of, of business models in here. You've got capital goods companies, services companies, more tech orientated companies. If you look at the AI portfolio, it contrasts quite significantly. So in the AI strategy, um, We've got just over 70 members at, at the moment. And really there, we're looking again, we've got this idea of identifying subsectors, but you end up with 
two groupings of companies. You have really the users of AI and you have the enablers of AI. So it's a slightly different strategy to what we're doing with Robo, but we think that's the, the best and the only way to play the AI theme. And as you look at that universe of companies, you'll notice there's a much lower revenue purity for, from the AI company. So you have to use this investment filter a lot deeper and it's a much larger cap portfolio. So, you know, the, the two strategies that they are, they are different. They will perform differently through different, different cycles. Um, and just one last question for you, Richard. Um, I mean, the typical business I'm guessing that might be in your robotics index is something like, I don't know, is a, is a car, is a Cardo, which is well known to UK names. Is a Cardo in your robotics index? They, they are. So we have a, a food and ag subsector yeah. and a Cardo sits in that. So are you finding, because I imagine that most of us traditionally thought robotics, kind of car factories, Japanese companies, engineers, yeah? But are you finding now that robotics and the associated sectors are beginning to creep now into more consumer orientated uh, functions? Is that is that a key trend in, in the index at the moment or, or not? No, it, it definitely is. It definitely is. So if you kind of look at where to date robotics and automation have had an impact, it's, you know, we can talk about manufacturing, we can talk about logistics and warehousing, we can talk about, you know, re re retail. And Ocado is a great example there. You know, there, there's, there's a company last year that had, I think it was about 20 years of market share in about 20, 20 weeks. And, yeah. and just to clarify one thing, David, on um, Ocado, the, the reason that they're, they're in the strategy is they obviously use robots to get groceries yeah. to our doorstep very, very quickly, but they sell that technology yeah. internationally yeah. to partners. Yeah. So they derive revenue, unlike Amazon yeah. that you were talking talking about earlier. Yeah. Um, but in terms of, yeah, what's next? I mean, absolutely, healthcare is going to, you know, I, we, we believe is going to be changed dramatically, not just by robotics and automation, but AI and life sciences technologies. That's why we've got a separate strategy. And yeah, absolutely. You know, things like food and ag is going to be a, a, an industry that's impacted significantly. Yeah, our, us as consumers, our homes, our cars. I mean, it, it, this technology is already all around us. You know, it, it's a lot more prevalent than we realise. So presumably, just on picking up on that thing about healthcare, which I completely get, presumably something like Microsoft being buying Nuance, you might suddenly find, you might find Microsoft appearing in your AI index. Yes, co correct, correct. You know, and you know that that is one of the big themes we've seen through the three strategies is is M and A activity. I mean, yeah. I, I haven't got the other data to hand, but I know for the, the robotic strategy since inception, we've had twenty four takeover attempts, which wow. you know, okay. for a portfolio of eighty companies is a pretty high to take out take out rate. And yes, and new, nuance was a a member of the strategy, so. Okay. Okay. Uh, Howie, just turning back to you, um, just looking at the, your competitive landscape, you, you, it's not the only robotics ETF out there on the market. What makes your di approach different? I think it, the first thing to remember is, as I mentioned at the very start, this was the f uh, launched just over about seven years ago, and it was one of the first strategies to enter into the market. And where it's really differentiated, and you probably heard it from Richard directly, is very much the active research and working with dedicated experts in this area. And it is this dynamic element um, that we're able to introduce into these funds uh, via the team at Robo Global, where we're constantly able to assess the leadership positions of these companies, we're constantly able to assess you know, what should be coming into the index via an expert lens. That's really what investors are buying into and have always been interested in. The other side of it is, I mentioned this earlier, is the fact that this can complement a portfolio very well. I challenge many investors to take a look at other potentially um, portfolios which are labeled as robotics and see actually how much it overlaps with another fund of theirs. And I think that's ex exactly where um, this again differs. If you overlay a number of the robotics funds or indices, probably about a quarter of the names um, overlap uh, with those other portfolios. So this is a, very much about highlighting and picking unique positions that sit alongside very well in an investor's portfolio. If I had to sum it up, I would, what I would say is that the way that we find growth here is actually by way of diversification of these high growth companies rather than increasing concentration risk in typical companies. That okay, and, and how's performance been? I mean, 
both against mainstream equities and against maybe other robotics ETFs? What's performance been like over the last, say, one year, few years, so we can get some sense of returns? Sure, of course. Um, if you take a look at the, let's say, even just the last 12 months, um, you know, the return of the index here, um, therefore the fund, is roughly just around 50%. Uh, if you take a look at, let's say, an MSCI World or an Acqui, uh reference point, that has performed roughly about 43% or so. So again, there's an outperformance. There's, there's obviously that equity correlation there, but there is an outperformance with a global equity portfolio. Let's kind of step back further and see you know, what kind of performance are we seeing in a three to five year time frame. Again, each of those time frames um, that I've referenced there there has been a outperformance during those periods, um, you know, over and on top of a global equity portfolio like MSCI Acqui. And how is it done against a, a, a more a more tech orientated um, uh, index? So I don't know, something like S and P five hundred tech or MSCI World Tech. Has it outperformed or is it underperformed against a tech index, a mainstream one? Yeah, so as you can imagine, when you've got a more diversified portfolio like we do on the robotic side, you know, we're covering not just the technologies themselves, but the applications downstream into the different industries that uh, Richard, of course, highlighted there. So it certainly wouldn't be a fair comparison to compare, let's say, the robotics portfolio with a typical tech fund. I think if, if investors are looking more at the technologies that are being deployed into various industries, I think the artificial intelligence, the AI portfolio is the more suitable one. But in any case, sure. in terms of growth and in terms of keeping up with such tech indices, yeah, you know, the, 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 the robotics portfolio with the performance I highlighted earlier has actually done a good job of doing that. You will, of course, see some spikes within certain tech indices through certain periods of time where you'll see actually some of the tech stocks had a bit of a rally. But bearing in mind, when you've got a tech stock rally, it can also go the other way. And what we've seen with the robotics um, portfolio, because of its diversification and its focus across technologies and applications, it, ha it helps to have to, to smooth out that um, uh, the, the volatility that you would normally see in the technology markets. So if I were to put it in a portfolio context, um, I'm guessing it's is it got higher beta than MSCI World. Um, it's still got correlation to equities, so you should see it as part of equities. But presumably, you would fit this in your growth equities bucket. Where would this sit in asset allocation terms? Yeah, it's a great question. It's a journey that we've been on with many investors um, because you know if I were to rewind five or six years ago, we would have a conversation where investors got the fact that this is a long-term growth theme that they needed this in their portfolio, but question how best to put it alongside traditional equity building blocks. If we take a look at how asset allocation generally takes place, um, you know, at this point, many investors use regional equity building blocks. So take a view on the European markets versus the US market versus the Asian markets. Some investors already have, let's say, a sector allocation like tech. They see this potentially as the, the new tech or a replacement for that tech, because again, this is about the new economy. Another way that we've seen investors do this is they're looking for global growth funds and they see long-term themes as being lo having long-term drivers because of digitalization, because of the uh, demographics, and they'll see this as actually a component within a global growth fund um, or allocation, I should say. The best kind of summary I can give is, you know, if an investor now seems to like to put say anywhere between five to 10% of their allocation in equities towards global growth themes. And quite a, lot of, quite a lot of times they will look at things like robotics automation, artificial intelligence, healthcare, and other areas. Um, so just, just bringing back Richard into the conversation with Harry as well. So one of the questions I suppose a lot of people ask about thematic indices, particularly growth indices, um, is that you do end up having, and, and you said it, Richard, you have a kind of more mid to small, small cap bias, which sort of goes to the terrain. How do you avoid the kind of concentration risk issues? Because that, that, that does concern some investors. It's like all thematic indices. As you head down the cap table, you tend to run into uh, smaller companies and ETFs can end up being quite a sizable portion of it. How do you manage that concentration risk problem, either Harry or Richard? 
It's 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 an important consideration, and you know, it's something that you know we, we've actually spent a lot of time with with the Elgin team and and our, our other partners. R right now, David, in in the methodology, we we have a specific rule that that caters to this, and it, it is important because if you look across our three strategies, and you look globally, there's well over four billion US dollars across multiple ETFs and funds tracking them. So every quarter, as we rebalance, we will accumulate all of the AUM that's tracking a particular c company across all, all product partners. And we will ensure that we don't have more than 5% free flow ownership. If we do, we will um, actually reduce that company's weight until it gets down to, to that threshold. So, you know, we, we actually very proactively make sure um, every quarter that we don't over own any particular companies. I think something else that's really important here, though, is just to reflect on the fact that, you know, these are very carefully researched and scored and selected companies in, in the strategies that they're, they're high quality companies. If you look at the robo portfolio as a, as a quick example, 61 percent of the companies aren't carrying any, any debt and that that massively outstrips what you'd see in sort of triple Q or the, the, the S&P. So these are high quality companies not not carrying um, a, a lot a lot of debt. So we're not we're not making my point is early tech bets on companies with a good idea and no revenue where, you know, you might see some sort of, you know, some trading or, or, or constraint um, issues. But I'll, I'll let Harry add anything else. Yeah, just th thanks, Richard. And, and you touched on some really important points there. And so both in the investment design on the index level, we've got to make sure that we have rules in place to manage liquidity and capacity. Now, bear in mind, this is a USITS fund. It's a USITS ETF. You know, for us, it's extremely important to ensure that we can maintain that capacity and maintain that liquidity. Uh, so partially it's done, you know, both at the index level, but we've also got to make sure that we leverage off the expertise of our portfolio management team that have been trading this portfolio for close to seven years and, you know, understanding how much we can buy in the market, how much we can sell in the market. Uh, and there are certain techniques in reflecting that. Uh, and there's a ongoing dialogue, back and forth conversation with the index provider, uh, you know, with the Robo Global team so that everybody is fully aware of the dynamics of the market. I think that rule of making sure that we don't have 5% of a the free float of any uh, single company in the, in, in the index and, and into the portfolio is actually a really helpful and important one. Uh, but there's a number of other techniques that we deploy to ensure that we maintain that liquidity and capacity in the portfolio itself. Um, one last question again for both of you. Um, if I had to give you, if you had to give me one example of the, something that's going on in the sector that you look at, even if it's a small example, which you think, now that's really exciting, that's interesting, what would you pick on, just to get some sense of how the sector's changing? Richard, I, I, as the industry expert, I'll, I'll pick the easiest on you first. Um, what, what do you think is, what, pick one thing you think just really interesting and you think, oh, no, no, we should definitely include that in the index. No, I think one really, you know, easy example where, you know, there's a massive benefit to society here, David, is, you know, within the healthcare subsector in robo and then obviously very much in the, the, the healthcare tech and innovation strategy, we, we cover ge genomics. And, you know, for us, this is going to be such a game changer for the, the healthcare industry that the fact now that we can actually at a, an individual level for a few hundred dollars actually sequence our DNA. It's so powerful. We, we, we will have the ability to predict very early or detect very early, I should say, signs of, of disease or um, likely problems. We'll then be able to go a step further and actually design for that individual a customized treatment plan. So, you know, if you think about healthcare today, it's broadly a system where sadly we have to wait until we get very, very sick we then bring lots of sick people together in a hospital environment and we spend a huge amount of money. It's actually 90 percent of, of healthcare globally is spent on chronic Ill illnesses. And with with DNA sequencing, it can absolutely change the, the landscape. And it's it's it, it started. You know, we, we've had the first um, treatments actually approved by, by the FDA for acute forms of leukemia. Uh, and I presume it'd be that's things like CRISPR machinery and all that kind of stuff. Is that, is it, is that included in that category? Uh, uh, absolutely. Absolutely. 
Yeah, okay. Uh, and Harry, again, you, you must have talked a lot about robotics when you talked to clients over the last couple of years. What's one thing that's piqued your interest? Yeah, indeed. And you know what? I think uh, I must share a very similar interest to Richard because I was actually going to talk about uh, gene therapy myself and, and look at companies like Illumina. But the healthcare space is, of course, extremely interesting. Um, you, you know, we've always had for some time a focus both in the robotics portfolio, um, you know, in, in, the, in the healthcare sector. But of course, we, 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 we dig into this even more through the healthcare breakthrough ETF. But, you know, you take a look at companies like Intuitive Surgical, where we have robotic operated um, surgeries taken place um, by robots called Da Vinci. And you can essentially have remote um patient care and surgeries where the doctor can be in one location and the patient in another. And this kind of precision technology uh, that's being deployed in the healthcare system is an amazing development. And I think that's good in an area that's going to continue to grow and build. Uh, you know, you kind of take a look at where we've all, what we've all experienced in the last 12 months and you know, COVID has required us to be socially distanced. Um, and that meant that, you know, things like that can continue to happen. But it also means that you know, there's been an upswing in telemedicine, for example, accessing healthcare through essentially digital means rather than face-to-face -face treatment. I think that is actually something that's here to stay and definitely going to continue to grow. And uh, uh, Richard, I'm afraid that the geek in me has got to ask you a last question. When do we think we're ever going to get androids? I'm a science fiction geek. I've got to, I've got to ask the question, and I've got a, a real-life robotics expert in the room. Do you think we'll ever get a, a real-life android? Um, yeah, well, to a certain extent, David, you know, we, we've got them. If, if you look in care homes in, in Japan, yeah. they actually have companion robots today that, you know, are they're, they're yeah. actually, you know, in the shape of, of animals there. But, you know, they, they actually provide, you know, a level of care and monitoring to to the effectively the, the owner you know it's 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 a particular sort of you know robot stroke stroke animal for yep. for the owner so you know in, in companion situations or certainly you know if you think about elderly people li li living on on their own it's often you know it's a scary concept but there's some very valuable um sort of um user cases today where it would make a big difference to to society so yeah i mean look but yes the the, the the tech is you know moving in that direction it depends on the context and you know what you're expecting it to uh to to, to do well that was richard lightbound there from robo global speaking after harry lee from elgin answering the inevitable geeky sci-fi question about the existence of androids in the future. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Under the Bonnet, where we try to get a deeper understanding of the thematic ETF, and hopefully you'll join us next time. Thank you for listening.